this week on the Backtable Podcast. Drug is the right way to get the longest benefit for a patient, to really reduce the risk of needing another procedure, coming back to the hospital, taking time off work, being bed bound, whatever it might be. So I typically put a drug code of balloon down in a lot of cases, even if I know I'm probably going to scaffold some of it, I still usually start with a DCB because I see no downside. And then from there, I could also focally stent or rely on the whole thing if I need to. But I almost always use drug coded technology in that same algorithm that I presented to you. Long fem pop outside of the distal SFA pop, I'm going to put in drug coded or drug leading stent. If it's the pop, I'm going to put in a supera. But I don't have many procedures where there's not some drug touching the patient. And I don't think there's any downside for double treating. You know what I mean? Again, I think that the drug coded balloon and the drug stents might have different properties. And when that paclitaxel might be most effective, I'm looking for long term benefit. And I think that the dual technology could have an impact, but at minimum, it's not going to hurt the patient. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Backtable, your source for all things endovascular and more. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on any platform like Spotify or even our website, backtable.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, and keep up with the latest updates and give us feedback through comments. Now, a quick word from our sponsors. Cook Medical has worked alongside the pioneers of peripheral medicine for 60 years. Their work with Paclitaxel started in the coronary space nearly 30 years ago and led to Zilver PTX becoming the world's first drug-eluting stent for the SFA. Proven through five-year trials that set a new industry standard with consistently successful outcomes and sustained durability. When paired with their exclusive prediction model, patient-level predictability with Zilver PTX is at your fingertips. Visit cookmedical.com slash Zilver PTX predictability to predict your patient outcomes. At Cook, they remain dedicated to providing therapies and technologies that treat peripheral arterial disease. Globally, PAD impacts millions of patients and requires specialized devices and treatment options to improve patients' quality of life. To learn more about their comprehensive portfolio of devices, visit cookmedical.com. Now, back to the show. I'm Sabine as your host today, and I'm happy to welcome Dr. Eric Sazemski from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Welcome back, Eric. Thanks, Sabine. Pleasure to be back. Absolutely. I think we've had you on for a couple of times, and every time has been great. And this time, we're going to be talking about the drug-eluting technology. And, and Eric, you've done a lot in drug-eluting technology in the vascular space. What piqued your interest and drive to go full force into this realm? Yeah, it's, it's really twofold and it's an, always an interesting conversation to have with specialists outside of the cardiology realm. You know, in interventional cardiology on the coronary intervention side, this is our lives. Like, are we've grown up with the evolution of drug technology? And, you know, when I went in to start doing my diagnostic angios as a fellow, we still had bare metal stents on the shelf and we had the first generation and then second generation drug looting stents. Now we even have third generation. And so we've watched this technology evolve to the point that we don't carry bare metal stents in cath labs anymore. So again, if you go back 10 years, you look at the patient, you'd say, oh, listen, they might have an issue that they come off their dual antiplatelet therapy early. They're not really good at taking meds long term. They might have some bleeding risk. Let's put a bare metal stent in. We know the long term data is not as great, but it saves us some risk on the short term. Now we have data showing that even drug looting stents for coronary purposes can go along with low duration of dual antiplatelet therapy up to one month. And so we just got rid of bare metal stents altogether. So when you look at an interventional cardiologist and you talk about drug-coded technology, this is our bread and butter. And so that was really what tied me in then to the second part of that, which was the paclitaxel controversy, which I know we'll speak about and how my passion for drug technology and then working through that real challenging situation kind of blended my interest in the coronary space to the peripheral space. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll totally get into that. I know you've been on before, but just for our listeners who might not know you, can you give us a little introduction about your practice and and what your main focuses are? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an interventional cardiologist by training. I trained over at the Mass General for most of my cardiology and interventional cardiology training. And then I did dedicated training in vascular intervention fellowship and in vascular medicine. And so I moved over and started a a vascular intervention program at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, which is about three miles from the Mass General. So I didn't have to move too far. 
But they weren't doing a lot of these procedures at the time. There's been a history of doing these procedures, but it was a little bit quiet. So I kind of rebooted the program. And I split my time when I'm in the cath lab between coronary intervention, which is about 30 to 50% of my time, and then peripheral intervention, which is the other half, if not more. And, you know, I really, even on the peripheral side, my main interest is lower extremity arterial disease. So if you can fill my day with lower extremity cases, I'd be a happy guy. And it doesn't always work out that way. But so I do a lot of infrainguinal and, and, and above the waist interventions, whether it's claudication or CLTI. And then, I, you know, my other pocket of procedures really focuses on pulmonary embolism interventions. That's been a big part of my career and more recently renal denervation. And, you know, I do all the other IVC filters and DVT. I always call myself, I got a little bit of IR, a little bit of vascular surgery and a little bit of interventional cardiology mixed into my practice. So, dude, I'm not surprised. I mean, I went to med school with Eric and he's probably the most smartest person I've ever met in my life. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a danger. We're, we're all screwed yeah. if that's the case. Yeah. So. <laughs> No, totally. So, okay, let's get back to drug eluding technology and specifically drug eluding stents. Um, there's a lot of vocab and terminology thrown around like scaffold, drug delivery method, drug. Tell us a little bit about what those mean and, and how they're different in different stents. Yeah, absolutely. So most of the backbones of our metallic stents in 2023 are, are really the same framework of the metal, metallic components, which I won't go into, but we've gone back and forth from same stent and scaffold, which in many places represent the same technology. But we also know that a supera stent is built differently than a self-expanding stent. And then also recently we've been reintroduced to the bioabsorbable scaffolds. And so the scaffold terminology is becoming more relevant and meaning that there's an implant after you've intervened. The makeup of a drug stent, a drug, I say drug stent and not drug coat or drug eluding, is differs based on the technology. And so in the coronary space, again, there's three components to a stent. There's the scaffold, there's the polymer, and then there's the drug. And the polymer is what eludes the drug over a certain amount of time. Now, the first drug coated stent, and I'm using coating here, in the periphery was the Zilver PTX stent. And that really changed the game. You know, this has been on the market, I think it was around 2012 when it really got introduced into the U.S. market. And that was the first and only drug-coated stent and remains the only drug-coated stent on the market now. And, and that is a metallic stent, again, with coating of paclitaxel. By coating, yeah. what do you mean by coating? Just It's just attached to the stent? Yeah, it's, and I don't want to say sprayed on because I feel like that doesn't do justice to the technology, but it's, in, a, in theory, sprayed onto the stent. And I think that that drug sticks around for about 90 days if I'm right, and I might be off by a little bit. And then the properties of the stent go back into a traditional bare metal stent. And then we've been introduced to the Luvia stent that kind of got rolled out during the um, paclitaxel controversy. So I had a little bit of a slow start, and then now has been more on the market. That one combines both the drug, the paclitaxel, the metallic background, the stent scaffold, and then a polymer. And so this is the first really polymer stent that allows for an illusion of the drug coating. I think that they tell you around like eight months out to 14 months is when it really starts to elude off and, and then eventually turns back into a bare metal stent. But the goal of the polymer was to mimic the illusion of drug during the highest risk period of restenosis. So that if you believe that at the end of one year and going into two years is when most of your FEMPOP interventions start to occlude, that that illusion of drug might prevent that from remaining patent. So essentially, the elution allows the drug to be delivered longer. Exactly right. Exactly right. And again, you can mess with these polymers to change the elution properties. There was a little bit of controversy in the coronary space that the polymer itself can cause some inflammation and could be contraproductive. So there's been a lot of changes in how we've designed these stents. And now even the polymer has become absorbable over time to really not leave anything outside of the stent behind. But, but all this technology evolves from picking a drug. And right now we've been picking in the periphery paclitaxel that there's been interest in limus-based therapies, picking up in some sense a polymer and in the in silver PTX stent, just coating the stent with that drug and then the scaffold. Okay. And really essentially, how is that different in drug-coated balloons where obviously the quote scaffold is a balloon, but are they also using a polymer and then the same drug? Yeah, so the drug-coated balloons are uh, a little bit different because there's no scaffold to elute any medication or, or anti-proliferative agent over time. And so you really have this one opportunity for transfer of drug 
from the balloon into the vessel wall. And so, as we know, when you put a drug-coated balloon in the body, about 70% of that drug goes elsewhere and about 30% of it, and not in a dangerous way, but just it absorbs off. And by the time you get the balloon actually delivered to the vessel wall, about 30% still on the balloon and probably only about 10 to 20% get against the vessel wall. But all the different drug-coated balloons have different proprietal ways of packaging the paclitaxel onto the balloon. And, and again, now we've seen this with the Limus technology, we talk about nanoparticles and other, other microspheres, other ways to transfer. But the goal is that you got to package the meds to transfer into the vessel wall. And if you talk to Elazar Edelman, who made one of the first coronary stents, he likes to say that it, it almost tattoos the wall with the drug so that you get as much of it pressed up against the wall. And then you expect for that to transfer into the vessel wall, deep in the vessel wall, and really contribute to the anti-proliferative properties of the paclitaxel for the currently marketed DCBs. But there's no polymer, there's no long-term elution, you know, you don't leave anything behind. So as much gets transferred on that one therapy, that's what you're left with. And hopefully it's enough, but I'm sure there's some situations where not enough transfer. And we know that with calcific disease, you know. And so, yeah, you mentioned paclitaxel and Limus. Taxel and Limus are really the, the two drugs that have been used on stents. As there anti-proliferative agents, I mean, are there other agents that have been looked at too? Are there's really, those are the only two that are shown to be effective? I'm sure there's been interest in many different agents for decreasing uh, anti-proliferative properties of restenosis. A lot of what we're doing in the periphery has been driven by how drug technology has evolved in the coronary space. And so back when the first generation coronary stents were made, they were taxol. They were they're, they're taxis-based. And the stents themselves worked really well. They prevented early and midterm restenosis that we we're seeing with bare metal stents. But the problem in the coronary stents is that it almost worked too well that there was risks of late occlusion. We call it stent thrombosis because of potentially paclitaxel being too aggressive and not letting the stent really endothelialize into the vessel wall. And then that metal scaffold was a nidus when he came off your antiplatelet therapy for uh, thrombosis. And so that's why in the peripheral world, we moved, two things happened. One, we started using dual antiplatelet therapy much longer to prevent that late restenose or that late occlusion. And then we evolved from paclitaxel to limus based. And there's a couple different limus drugs. And that really, the limus with the polymer and the corner space allowed for this more consistent illusion and more really successful long-term reduction in thrombosis rates that that's become the standard of care and all our stents now are limus based. In the periphery, you have to think of the peripheral space a little bit differently. It's First off, it's a larger vessel, so occlusion rates are going to be different. Corner vessels are three millimeters, and SFA is six to eight millimeters. So you don't have the same small vessel that you worry about with the scaffold. The other thing is it's in a very aggressive area for atherosclerosis, as we all know. You need a really effective agent there. And so that's where Paclitax has been so successful is it's an aggressive anti-proliferative agent. It moves through the vessel wall very successfully. It, it's a very aggressive anti-proliferative agent. And that has made Paclitaxel really an incredibly successful drug in the peripheral vascular space. That's interesting. You know, I was always thinking, I was like, why aren't the, the limus is shown to be so effective in coronary? Why is it just all the peripheral stents, limus too. But it's interesting that paclitaxel is stronger and that's why, you know, it's a bigger vessel. Yeah, there's a lot of differences between the two of them and we can nerd out about it, I'm sure, for a while. But I think the thing that I think about a lot is one. they've looked at limus in the periphery before and some of the biggest issues is just it's harder to package and deliver successfully through the vessel wall. And so the older technology and there's been some other stents also that have had limus on them haven't been successful. But now the newer technology, we know there's a lot of interest in this across industry, has different mechanisms for packaging that limus that could, in theory, be successful. And, and most of that's being advanced in the below the knee space right now, where paclitaxel hasn't shown benefit. But I'm sure we'll see more above the knee as well and on stents. And I would last comment there is that when you put the limus with a polymer, it's much easier to deliver, just like in the coronary stent. And that, and that might be the future also is that paclitaxel stents work great. We'll see maybe some limus stents. We'll have to see if they work as well as a paclitaxel stent. Yeah. So 2018 was a big year for paclitaxel and, and the whole debate came up about the risk safety profile. What are your thoughts now? You've done so much work. What are your whole thoughts and overall opinion about the safety profile of drug eluding stents and technology? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think that it's fun to sit here almost four years later, 
But that was, you know, December 2018 when it was published and or five years later now, gosh. And it's crazy to have lived through it. You know, we all lived through it together. And it's so awesome to see in our careers that there was this big controversy and that we almost got to live through the resolution of it as well. You know, I think oftentimes these things linger and they don't have the same ending. And it was really awesome. And so I'll, I'll just con- I'll comment on that. So the first thing is I grew up learning peripheral intervention with drug-coated balloons and drug-coated stents as part of my daily practice. I always use this analogy when I speak about paclitaxel. If you went to the cath lab and told me during coronary intervention, guys, I really need to get rid of every drug looting stent off the shelf. You can either bring back bare metal stents or you can only balloon. I mean, we would shut down. I mean, I think and no one would agree that we can do our procedures anymore in the same way and benefit our patients. And so to come in and say, all oh, drug code technologies needs to halt because of this alarm signal from this analysis is challenging. You know, it was challenging for my own practice. And I got involved because I'm interested in this, but obviously I got more involved because it was affecting my patient care. And I saw that it was going to affect patient care throughout the world. Now, something that a lot of us brought up from the beginning is this whole controversy was started on some shaky data. And it's not that the trial data isn't sound. It's just that the trial data never was meant to examine mortality. And so when you introduce all these variables like loss to follow-up, repeat treatment, crossover, you know, I think that you create a very complex scenario where you don't really know what you're measuring in the end because you don't know what that pathway, the journey of that patient was. The person who got randomized to balloon angioplasty in the original Zilver trial potentially went and got a Zilver stent. We saw that that happened in a meaningful amount of patients, but they weren't being treated that way. They're treated as only in the balloon arm. And so there's a lot of nuance to that meta-analysis that wasn't adding up. And then we never could really demonstrate a mechanistic fashion of how a one-time treatment with what is relatively low-dose paclitaxel can cause such a high risk of death, 7%. I mean, that's just a number that, you know, it's hard to think of things that can cause 7% more death. Unless, 7%. Right? Unless you're trying, unless you're trying <laughs> yeah. to kill someone. But so I think the most important thing, though, is, and the FDA said this themselves, is if it wasn't death, there would have maybe been a different response. But death is such an important endpoint to everyone, patients, to clinicians, to regulators, to the population level. So because it was such a important endpoint that was being presented as associated with these devices, the FDA had to take it seriously. And again, it was a really unique process watching industry come together and find out how to work together and then solve this issue. Clinicians and societies working with the FDA, to find ways to support the process and independent investigators generating data to help guide the regulatory process. So really a, a remarkable time for the vascular field. I think everybody should be proud how people came together, trying to do what's best for the patient, make sure the patient risks weren't there that with everything that we care about our patients first, that we're doing things with them in mind. But in July of this past year, the FDA finally reviewed all the updated data, they had an updated independent patient data meta-analysis. So they got the individual trial data with all these updated trials that had lost a follow-up, some newer trials that had longer-term data. This was published in Lancet in October by Sahil Parikh, Bill Gray, Peter Snyder, and others. And that really gave the FDA the confidence to say, you know, we, we don't have a true sense that this association is actually real and that these devices are causing harm and really reversed all their stances on paclitaxel. Yeah, so that was a very important article and stance. And it was an interesting time to live through because we all knew drug eluding stents were working great and, and drug eluding technology is working great. And having those challenges or saying, oh, having those conversations with those patients at that time, five years ago, four years ago, was, was difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I'll tell you something. I was sitting through, I was at Viva sitting through a talk about durability of drug-coated balloons and drug-loading stents. And they're reviewing all this interesting data and all. And it was so nice and refreshing to sit there. And it wasn't about mortality. And it wasn't about how do I consent my patients and how do we get through this controversy? And where do, it was about the data and the science and the technology. And so it's just really refreshing for us to kind of go back to where we started and think about what a breakthrough technology does to a space like peripheral intervention. Yeah, totally. So... Along the lines of stenting, in the past, there would be, quote, leave no metal behind. What's your general sense on your stenting algorithm for, say, fempop disease? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and again, there's always different ways to break that down, claudicants and CLI, CLTI. But in the average case, you know, I think that 
the no scaffold or leave nothing behind approach is really sound in particular for specific lesions. So if you have a very focal lesion, if you have a lesion in a very aggressive area that, you know, stent fracture could be an issue, you know, Hunter's Canal, anything in the distal SFA pop, you know, those areas are definitely going to benefit from having no scaffold left behind. That said, that's not the reality for the majority of disease that we encounter. We encounter today long occlusions, aggressive hostile areas with calcification. We use reentry, whether we intend to or not, <laughs> we reuse reentry. And that's where Ivis has taught me so much. And so there's just some areas we all know where you can try and try again, but you cannot keep that open without a scaffold or it may not be the right strategy for a very long occlusion. And that's really where these stents come into play, the scaffolds. And that's for me where I almost only use drug-coated scaffolds is for when I I know that a a scaffold-free approach is not going to work. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. I was going to ask you, you, are you using bare stents at all? You know, (laughs) I can't. In the fem fem pop segment, are you even using bare stents minus, I guess, obviously interwoven supera? But other than that, are you using bare stents? Yeah, great question. You know, if, if anything, if I ever have to stent, particularly P2, P3, it's always a supera. You know what I mean? So I, will, I won't put anything else in there. And honestly, anything from distal SFA through P3, I'm usually using a supera. Anything that's not involved in that distal zone, I'm almost universally using a drug-coated stent. And I've been using Zilver PTX for many years, uh, including back to when I trained at Mass General. I also have a Luvia drug eluding stent. And so I have the opportunity to use and learn for both of these scaffolds, but that's my approach for any long segment fempop disease that is not ripe for a leave nothing behind strategy. And I think that's, I think my algorithm has been successful. Yeah, I totally agree. I share the same opinion. What about now, like you're treating a lesion, you're trying to not leave a scaffold behind, you do a DCB treatment. And then do you think there's an additive effect of having a DES on top of a previously treated DCB? Great question. You know, we actually, last year, or I think it was in the Journal of Invasive Cardiology, we presented a series of patients treated with DCB and DES, led by Aaron Armstrong and his fellow Stefano Giannopoulos. But it was a single arm anecdotal study. I mean, again, it's not life-breaking science, but the concept here was, is it safe? And, you know, is there a role for it? And, and I think also more recently, PK Prakash Krishnan from Mount Sinai published an experience of DCB and then Supera. So my feeling is, and again, I, I'm going to put my interventional cardiology cap on. This is my bias and conflict here is I believe in drug and it's because of being an interventional cardiologist and living in that space for a core intervention is drug is the right way to get the longest benefit for a patient, to really reduce the risk of needing another procedure, coming back to the hospital, taking time off work, being bed bound, whatever it might be. So I feel that I, I typically put a drug coat of balloon down in a lot of cases, even if I know I'm probably going to scaffold some of it, I still usually start with the DCB because I see no downside. And then uh, from there, I could also focally stent or reline the whole thing if I need to. But I almost always use drug coated technology in that same algorithm that I presented to you. Long fem pop outside of the distal SFA pop, I'm going to put in drug coated or drug leading stent. If it's the pop, I'm going to put in a supera. But I don't have many procedures where there's not some drug touching the patient. And I don't think there's any downside for double treating. You know what I mean? Again, I think that the drug coated balloon and the drug stents might have different properties. And when that paclitaxel might be most effective, I'm looking for long-term benefit. And I think that the dual technology could have an impact, but at minimum, it's not going to hurt the patient. Sure. What about, do you think, and there's probably data on this too, what about lithotripsy before putting uh, drug coated technology? Does that improve the delivery of the drug to the target? This is probably one of the hardest questions that remain, and, and it feeds into the whole idea of plaque modification and, and atherectomy really is, you know, what is the value of atherectomy? And, and I'm, I'm lumping intravascular lithotripsy with plaque modification and atherectomy. And one of the main feelings across the space is that atherectomy and plaque modification help in calcific disease, the transfer of drug into the vessel wall to be effective. And this comes back to Fabrizio Finelli, who had this really classic slide just demonstrating what happens with drug coated balloons and calcific disease and the inability for a drug to make any penetration to the vessel wall. And so the problem, though, is it's been really challenging in a non-animal model to demonstrate this clinically. 
And there's been several attempts anywhere from the Viva Reality Trial, which used directional atherectomy with the TCB, to PAD3, which is a randomized trial of lithotripsy with drug codeblune versus drug codeblune itself. And so to your comment about IVL, the PAD3 trial really was trying to do two things. One, show the early benefits of intravascular lithotripsy combined with a drug codeblune, which was standard of care. And then they looked at this out to two to three years. And what they found in that trial was intravascular lithotripsy decreased the risk of bail out stenting. It was really a safe and effective way to prep before drug code of balloon angioplasty. The problem was the patency looked good in the long term, but the DCB arm that didn't get lithotripsy got a lot of stents. And so it's really a hard to understand the patency differences, if there were any, when you're comparing now DCB and stent versus IVL and DCB and how much the drug impacted those long term outcomes. So the bottom line is, I mean, I do feel like if you have a cleft of calcium and you're putting paclitaxel on it, it's just going to be on calcium. And vessel prep's important. And I use IVL. I use a little bit of atherectomy. I'm not a heavy atherectomy user. But more importantly, I think getting drug to the vessel wall is, is critical for long-term outcomes. Yeah, makes sense. Speaking of long-term outcomes, there's been a couple of predictability models, particularly one that's available online by Cook. Do you use that? Yeah, absolutely. So data is an important part of everything. And in particular, these data models or prediction models to help really consult patients even before a procedure are critical. And so during the paclitaxel controversy, the question was, how do you identify a patient who's high risk enough to get a drug coded technology if you were concerned that signal was real? And Cook Medical really led the way with their data. They had the longest term data on um, the five-year data for the silver PTX10 had been published, and they were incredibly transparent. And I think everybody in the field recognized that Cook took a leading position in terms of being transparent about their data and standing by their technology. And there's a, a gentleman named Aaron Lottis. Aaron was a statistician at Cook who's a wonderful guy. He actually went to academia, but still affiliated with Cook, but helped put this together with the Cook team, a prediction model. And they used their data and registry data to identify predictors of a high likelihood of needing a repeat intervention. So it's freedom from target lesion revascularization. And they used a number of really available variables to help generate a really realistic prediction rate for the likelihood of repeat intervention. So they have about eight patient demographic variables that are anywhere just from age, sex, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, claudicin, or CLI. So easy stuff that we have on our mind when we're presenting any patient. And then if you have a diagnostic angio available, they had some lesion characteristics, length, reference vessel diameter, total occlusion, calcification, prior intervention, and runoff. So again, there was about 15 variables in total, eight patient, seven from the lesion characteristics. And you plug all these numbers in, and then they give you a really nice estimation of freedom from target lesion revascularization from 12 months out through five years. And so When this started, I think that it was an opportunity to say, if we are going to limit how much paclitaxel we expose patients to, but balance that there is a risk of needing a repeat intervention if you use just a balloon angioplasty or or non-coated bare metal stent, this is a good way to guide that conversation. If you had really high risk of restenosis, maybe let's just do what we think is best for you with the drug coded technology. Now, with paclitaxel being safe, it's not about reserving paclitaxel. But just thinking a little bit about how you leave a procedure. We all know that we don't want to aim for perfection because that gets us in trouble. But we also know that we got to think about the risk, long-term risk for a patient. And that goes anywhere from their age, the severity of their disease, CLI versus claudication, to the lesion morphology. This helps us just be realistic with our patient that you have a, a fairly high risk of TLR. We are going to be really aggressive with how you treat you because... The only way we know how to modify that, if you're already going towards an intervention, is to be really complete with our intervention. And I think that's where this prediction model can be really helpful for that conversation with the patient and a reminder to the clinician about the risks of that patient. Yeah. And kind of a follow-up to this prediction model and, and revascularization, a repeat interventions, how does economics play into this? I mean, these stents are more expensive than your bare stent. And for you and I who work at hospitals, it's a a little bit different. For someone who is working at an outpatient center, it may change. So how do economics play into the use of DES? Absolutely. I mean, it's a it's a challenging question. You know, again, just like you said, when I'm in the hospital doing an intervention, I'm never reckless, but I don't have that spotlight on me because 
the package of that reimbursement is usually more than enough to cover whatever I'm going to do if, and, and more. The ambulatory space is different. And I always joked about the first pack the tax of controversy. I was sitting on a panel at a conference called TCT or a couple months before 2018, before pack the tax of controversy. And we were discussing the low use of drug coated balloons in the ambulatory setting which was driven by changes in reimbursement. They didn't get an extra payment for them. And it wasn't in the financial algorithm in most ambulatory settings because of the cost being somewhat prohibitive to the total needs of the center. And so as we fast forward to 2023 into 2024, we've got to really take a look at ourselves as a space. You know, we have so much controversy right now with the New York Times article and atherectomy in general, differences between specialties and even beyond specialties, differences based on where you're practicing. And I think at the end of the day, we've just got to find ways to move back to a patient-centered approach. And so if we all agree that drug technology is proven to reduce repeat interventions and keep people out of procedure labs, it's got to be priority. And that's got to be both on the ambulatory setting to find ways to make that financially solvable, but also on the industry side to think of creative ways to make these readily available for ambulatory settings that have different needs and differences in terms of their reimbursement patterns. And so I've seen and heard already that some more and more ambulatory settings are bringing in drug coded technology and, and able to find methods to make the reimbursement and the payments doable. So again, we just have to hold ourselves to a, a high standard of putting the patient first and the finances second, but the finances are real strain and, and they've got to come closely second. Yeah, yeah, totally. Any particular trials that you want to highlight with drug-coded technology and, and DES? I mean, from a very basic trial, like, like Eminent, right? You want to speak a little bit on that and Imperial? Yeah, absolutely. There are a few trials that are must. And there's many trials out here, so I don't want to limit our conversation. I want to make one comment first before we go into Imperial and Eminent, but the Zilver PTX trial, Cook was ahead of the game. This was the first drug-coded stent technology, period. And they led the way this trial was done in the 2000s, you know, so 2000 and I think eight or something around there. And so this was really a uh, breakthrough technology that Cook helped champion and set the whole field in a different direction. And so it was a just around 500 patients. And it was a complex trial because the standard of care was still balloon angioplasty. So the primary randomization was the Cook PTX stent and then balloon angioplasty. And then if angioplasty failed, there was a secondary randomization to either a provisional bare metal stent or a DES. So very complicated. And again, it goes back to why that trial was controversial in the paclitaxel setting. But the most important thing was they have data out through five years and now longer. And if you continue to follow these patients out, they do really well with the drug coded technology. Everybody has a different definition of what well means. This isn't CLTI, typically these are claudicants. And so, but we know that patency, freedom from TLR, all of these were really improved out through five years with the drug coded stent, the silver PTX stent. So fast forward to Imperial, which was published, I think in late 2018. And this was Boston Scientific's trial to look at the IDE, the approval of the Luvia polymer drug eluding stent. And they did something different than people were doing in the space. They compared it head to head with the market lead, the Zilver PTX stent. And so I think for a field, this is a really important trial to conduct because we need these type of data to guide our decision making. We need to have some head to head trials. And that's not happening from a regulatory standpoint because the regulatory process usually just makes you compare to the standard of care, which some places is just plain balloon angioplasty. So it was important for us to say, what, how do these two technologies compare? And, you know, the period trial showed some important stuff. And, and again, you learn more as the study ages. When we first started the trial, the imperial primary results published in Lancet in September 2018 showed first that there was non-inferiority. So there's no differences in terms of the ability of the silver PTX to perform, or inside the Luvi stent to perform to the level of the silver PTX stent. Now, again, this trial was around 460 patients and it was two to one randomization. So again, there, there are some limitations there, but then they said they went on in the trial. If they met non-inferiority, they could look for superiority. And there was some benefit at one year for the Luvia drug loading stent over the silver PTX. Now, as you've gone on past one year, the benefit of that has kind of narrowed. And, and really how I look at it is these two stents together are really 
important effective stents. Yeah. And again, one year is not really what most of us, especially for claudicans, are thinking about. We want to get two, three, four years out of it. The last study that you mentioned was the eminent study. And it's, it's just worth commenting on because, again, this, as important it was to run Imperial as a head-to-head trial, the question remained, well, what about our bare metal stents? And we haven't really seen a contemporary trial randomizing the best drug coded technology to bare metal stents. And so eminent trial compared the alluvia stent to the average bare metal stent. And I think around 15 to 20% of the bare metal stents were superas. So it was a combination of probably best technology and average stent technology. But at one year, again, there is a benefit of a drug loading stent over a bare metal stent. And we'll hopefully see some longer term data on that trial. But overall, the bottom line is we've got some really good stent options right now. And they're clearly better than PT. I think we can all agree on that. They're better than probably an average bare metal stent. I think that's also clearly demonstrated now. And there's more trials now looking at the comparison of like DCB and a drug limiting stent. And there was a trial called the sports trial that compared outcomes between bare metal stent, DCB, and DES. And that trial showed really a nice outcome for DCB. And, you know, I think that with DES, as needed, there's an algorithm to be had there. But DCB and the Luby DES and sports trial, which was presented at TCT this year, outperformed bare metal stents. So I'm going to conclude my blurb here as saying that there's probably very little role for balloon angioplasty alone. There's probably a very limited role for bare metal stent and probably DCB before bare metal stent, if you're going to use them, makes sense if that's financially possible. But I definitely think the future is in these drug coded technologies. What what a change from like five years ago when we were dealing with this this debate, and now it's like I know. No, this is obviously better. I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. It's great though. I mean, it's great where we live in a abyss of evidence in the vascular space to finally have evidence to say that. You know, I mean, I have trials to support each of those comments, and that's really what this field has needed for a long time. And so I'm proud that that's the direction it's gone. Yeah. Next question is about future technologies, right? Are any benefit of using drug on stent graphs, like maybe the edge of the stent graphs or things like that? I love that question. I, th- I think about that all the time because we were sitting up at Viva talking about PQ bypass. As people are not familiar, the detour trial looked at this percutaneous bypass that you could perform along long femoral uh, SFA pop lesions. And we were just talking about cover stents and when they do fail, where do they fail? And as you mentioned, Sabine, they almost universally fell at the edges. So I, when I do put in, I don't put in a ton of infraguinal covered stents. I'm thinking more about that, in particular for ISR. There's good data on that. But when I, when I <clears throat> do use them, I think that using a drug coated balloon to really hit the edges is probably a good way to experiment whether that can reduce some of the aristenosis when it does occur. I mean, I think that could use some more data. And so I can't, can't give that a level one, but that's a great question. Something I've, I've thought and, and talked a little bit about. Sure, sure. And what about, there's other spot stenting like tax and things like that, that any utility, any other utilities you see that you see drug might be coming out to? I mean, you mentioned bioabsorbable stents too. I'm not sure. Where are we at that on those? Yeah, so TAC is a great technology. And again, that is really meant to be a dissection repair device. And so I, I, th- I think it sits in its own space a little bit. And if you really, as we discussed, buy into this idea of a really a minimal scaffold-free approach, tech gives you the opportunity to really reduce the need of having a lot of metal and stenting a whole segment where that might only just need some repair. So really cool technology and really was a unique thing to come to market. I think that the big 2023 attention has been on the bioabsorbables, but primarily for the below the knee space. And the bioabsorbables right now, most of the technology are combining an absorbable scaffold. And that's why we're moving away from the word stent with drug. And these drugs primarily are limus because, again, it's easier with a scaffold to package limus on there than to package it on a balloon in some situations. And we know limus works well. I mean, with their coronary DS proximal tibials, I mean, those stay open. Exactly those right. Stay open. Absolutely <laughs> right. That's what everybody says, right? They're like one segment that, that you might get horrific resinosis below it. And then you have this beautiful stent there. I'm excited and I'll, I'll put the plug in there that maybe you'll invite me back in three or five years and we'll talk about how that below the knee algorithm has changed. But I think that the idea of the future is proximal tibials will get a scaffold 
Right now, we're thinking that the bioabsorbables could be the right scaffold for the proximal tibials. They can deal with recoil. They can deal with dissection. They can deal with recalcitrant lesions, but they absorb with time and you don't have that risk of having metal there or precluding you from a bypass or something in the future. And then more distal disease that goes down closer to the ankle, we're really hoping that these Lymus DCBs are successful or the right paclitaxel DCB comes out. So I think that that algorithm is going to look very different in the next five years. And then that might creep back up into the above the knee space, looking at bioabsorbables there. But I don't think we're at that point yet. Well, that's cool. Eric, I have a feeling we'll have you back on uh, sooner than three to five years. So <laughs> that was really great. I mean, that's a lot of information we covered. I mean, this, you know, a big take home point is drug coded technology, drug eluding technology works. And really, you should be using this in your treatment of peripheral vascular disease. It's obviously been shown in your coronary. I mean, you said you don't even have a bare metal scent on the shelf on the coronary. <laughs> exactly. Exactly yeah. right. Super great to have you on. Any last words of wisdom, parting wisdom regarding this? Just first up, thanks, Sabino. It was easy and fun to have a conversation with you. And Backtable's been just so successful of bringing these type of conversations to everyone. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be on here. And, and for the audience, hopefully, if you haven't seen Sabine or I on, on social media, we're on there. So reach out. And if you have any questions, please let us know. But if I can just summarize, if you go to the Cook website, you can find your way to the Zover PTX prediction model. It's fun to play with, see if that fits into your algorithm. Take a look at the data. I mean, it's really important to know the data in this space. Think about the anywhere from the Zover PTX trial, Imperial, Eminent, and Sports, which will be published soon. I think that those are a great foundational knowledge you need to be in this space. And hopefully that will help drive your practice. And that, that's what should is the evidence. So again, thanks for being for allowing me to, you know, wax and wane on, on my feelings at drug coded technology here. And hopefully people will find this uh, interesting. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, Social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lui Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 